Is that for me? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I can't tell you what an honor it is for me to be uh, asked to moderate this uh, opening session uh, today. Um, the game plan is that I'm going to ask each of our very distinguished three speakers to say a few words before having a conversation with them, and then opening the floor up so there's as much time as possible for uh, questions and answers and, and a broader conversation. Uh, I don't think the speakers need much introduction. Uh, Mark has been so eloquent, Lakhtar, about, about you, but I mean, among your many achievements as foreign minister, as, 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 as chair of the Brahimi report, and indeed as special envoy, uh, uh, to, uh, or, or a joint envoy to Syria. Ian, as head of Amnesty International, uh, as special envoy for the Timor Popular Consultation, as well as SRSG in Timor, in Libya, and elsewhere. And Comfort, as, as um, uh, head of uh, Africa Research at the International Crisis Group. I know we're going to have a terrific conversation today. I think Kofi Annan's life can be explained in some ways by a commitment to protecting and promoting human dignity, especially for people at risk of or experiencing violence. Whether he did that at UNHCR, whether it was as head of peacekeeping, whether as Secretary General, or indeed in the many commitments he he, he took on uh, since leaving the UN uh, at the Kofi Annan Foundation with the elders in Kenya uh, as the joint envoy to Syria and indeed AGRA, uh, the Africa Progress Panel. And he championed so many initiatives, whether the Millennium Development Goals, uh, the Panel on Peace Operations, the Rome Statutes, or the responsibility to, to protect. Um, and he was a passionate advocate for the role of the UN as a, as a practical force for good uh, and of the role of the Security Council as the ultimate source of legitimacy. So what would be great in our conversation today is to get your sense of his legacy uh, and what we can learn from him that is relevant today and going forward. And what is the future? What does the future hold, uh, particularly peacekeeping and, and responsibility to protect in light of some of the phenomena that we've already heard about this morning, including the erosion of, of multilateralism and, and, and gridlock in the Security Council, uh, the Trump phenomenon, uh, the way Russia uh, is reasserting itself, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, approach, uh, including to the UN, the emergence of mid-sized powers, such as, but not only, in the Gulf, who are being very assertive. And, of course, powerful new trends, such as climate change and social media. I understand that 50% of the world's population is now online, uh, and 70% of those online are uh, young people. Um, growing inequality in the role of, of, dark, of, of dark money and the phenomenon of internationalized civil wars. Where does this leave the, that ambition to protect people, to protect human dignity? The toolbox, where, how, what is the toolbox still in good shape? And is the UN uh, able to use it and deploy it in ways uh, that, 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 that really is going to move things forward. So, Lakhtar, will you kick us off? <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Nan, it's a pleasure, as always, to see you and the family. Um, you see, Kofi is still bringing us together, even when he's not here anymore. Uh, what uh, Mark uh, said about his being summoned by Kofi and even by me. Kofi never summons anybody. Uh, 
Uh, you just somehow do what he wants you to do. Um, you know, uh, Co uh, Boutros asked me three times to go to Afghanistan, and I very politely said no, and he agreed. Uh, Kofi asked me only once. He didn't, I don't know whether he asked me or ordered me, but anyway, I found myself saying yes. <laughs> and uh, I went to Afghanistan not once, but twice. Uh, there is a be much better story about how Kofi makes you do things uh, that is told by uh, Ernesto Zedillo. I mean, some of you here have heard him say it himself. Uh, he's just been out of office as president of Mexico when Kofi called him and said, ah, good morning, what are you doing, and so on. Why don't you come over? And uh, Ernesto said, yes, with great pleasure. Will you send me a, a, a ticket? Kofi said, no, no, you, you come on, you know, uh, you can pay your ticket. <laughs> uh, so he, he arrived, it was December, I don't remember which year, uh, to New York, and uh, Kofi told him, you know, we're trying to see if the private sector can do something to work with the United Nations. And uh, Ernesto said, yeah, this is a great idea. And Kofi said, you, you are a great economist, uh, so you think it's a good idea? He said, yes. So, you know, perhaps we can organize them and do something. And then also said, yes, it's a great idea. And said, you know, we'll think about it and we'll be in touch again. And Kofi said, no, 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 we're going out. There's a press conference. We will announce that this is being created and you will be the president. <laughs> uh, you see, this is how Kofi uh, does, uh, uh, does, 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 does business. Um, you know, you have spoken of, uh, uh, multilateralism. I am fortunate that I have continued to work with uh, Kofi in the elders. And one of the most important things that we are trying to do is to see how we can uh, speak about, uh, familiarize people with the idea of multilateralism, which, is, which seems to be in, 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 real, uh, in real danger now. Um, you know, we, we, did, we did a number of things in the elders that Kofi uh, led, and really he was the force behind uh, uh, something about uh, refugees, uh, something about health, uh, universal uh, health coverage. Uh, that was also something that uh, was very dear to his heart. In the United Nations, when I, I was there, uh, I think, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, remember when he became, when he became head of uh, uh, DPKO, uh, peacekeeping. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, there was a great deal of interest and uh, hope that with the end of the Cold War, uh, the United Nations was going to solve all the problems very easily and so on. But uh, uh, Srebrenica and uh, Rwanda, uh, were, were, were a huge shock. And actually, people in the United Nations, member states, started saying, you know, perhaps it's a, it was a mistake. Uh, the UN cannot really uh, do peacekeeping, and perhaps this department should be, uh, you know, we, should, we should scrap it, we should uh, forget about it. Uh, but the, the uh, coffee had the, courage and the vision to commission the Carlson report on uh, Rwanda and his own report on Srebrenica. Uh, and that was greeted with a great deal of respect and admiration because he recognized that mistakes have been made. Uh, of course, you know, after that, a lot has been, a lot of stupid things have been said about the UN having been responsible for the genocide or for uh, uh, or, or, or for Srebrenica. No, no, the UN made mistakes, but it was not responsible. If there is responsibility for Srebrenica in particular, it's member states, and especially the Security Council. Uh, be that as it may, uh, you know, uh, the Carlson report, the uh, uh, Secretary General reports on Srebrenica, and our own report on peacekeeping uh, 
brought back the interest and the support for, uh, for, 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 for peacekeeping. The two other things that were terribly important for coffee was uh, these were really personal initiatives uh, of his. Uh, one is uh, the responsibility to protect. He really pushed it single-handed until uh, it ended up being unanimously adopted by the, uh, all, all the uh, membership. And also uh, the ICC, International Criminal Court. We had a very heated discussion uh, not very long ago about uh, this, because uh, he was extremely unhappy that some African members, uh, some African countries wanted to withdraw from the ICC. Uh, but that is understandable. The ICC is not doing well. And I think he, he, he said that uh, you know, it needs to be fixed. Uh, but I don't know who is going to push for it to be fixed uh, uh, in, in the future. I think this is, this is more than enough in the beginning. Uh, okay, well, thank you. I mean, do you, do you see s new sources of support for the UN role in peacekeeping or responsibility to protect, or do you think it's a pretty... Well, the, the responsibility to protect has been wounded by the resolution nine, uh, 1973 on Libya. Uh, yes, I think that uh, it, it can be saved and it has to be saved because the international community needs something like that. Uh, but I think it, it needs a lot of mobilization that it be uh, really what it is meant to be and not something that is used in the wrong manner, the way it has been by the Security Council in, my, in Revolution 1970. So it needs rebooting. Yeah. Ian. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. It's a privilege to be here, uh, and a particular pleasure to follow Mr. Brahimi, who I served under in my first United Nations job in Haiti 25 years ago. Uh, but to remember Kofi Annan, I want to begin by going back, not 25, but 20 years, uh, because we just passed the 20th anniversary of the agreement of the 5th of May 1999 between Indonesia, Portugal uh, and the United Nations, uh, under which East Timor would eventually exercise its right to self-determination. And that was made possible by political change in Indonesia, but it was also because the UN was well placed to take advantage of that opening because Kofi, as one of his first acts when he became Secretary General in 1997, had decided to uh, re-energize the negotiating process. Uh, and therefore, he took a very personal role in the end in the successful conclusion of those negotiations. But he took an even more central role after the Timorese had voted overwhelmingly for independence and when they were punished by the violence and destruction that followed that ballot. Uh, and the mission that, that I headed, that had carried out the popular consultation, was besieged with uh, internally displaced Timorese in our compound. But the UN faced the dilemma of how not to abandon not just those people, but the, the Timorese in general. I, I know that uh, Kofi thought of Rwanda at that time uh, and in the days and nights that followed the outbreak of that violence, saw perhaps the most intense telephone diplomacy that he ever engaged in, day and night indeed, and night indeed, indeed, uh, as he worked to persuade President Habibi of Indonesia to uh, invite international assistance, as he remained in constant contact with President Clinton, Prime Minister Howard in Australia, uh, Antonio Guterres, then Prime Minister of Portugal, Robin Cook here in the, the, the UK, secured Indonesian consent and prepared a truly humanitarian intervention in perhaps the shortest time uh, it had ever been both agreed to and, and mounted. Uh, and I start with that because I do believe it was one of the finest hours of his personal diplomacy and, and one which I witnessed. But those events 20 years ago in East Timor also allowed me to make a point uh, about the diversity of peace operations, uh, which are often only associated with blue helmet military operations. Uh, but of the three operations mandated that year and released to East Timor, 
One was a political electoral mission to carry out the popular consultation. One was a multinational force, but properly mandated by the Security Council, more rapidly than blue helmets could be deployed. And the third, the transition administration in East Timor, uh, was something that peacekeeping was certainly not invented to do, although it included uh, blue helmets, uh, but had more than two years of governing East Timor under Sergio uh, Vieira de Mello. So I mention that because the diversity of peace operations was central to our thinking when we followed in Mr. Brahimi's path in the second major review of peace operations, uh, not named after its chair, Jose Ramos Horta, but named after its acronym HIPPO, the High Level Panel on Peace Operations. There are a few insights, I think, in our report that are not there to be found in the Brahimi report. We stood on the shoulders of what you said and recommended, uh, of what had been implemented, but also of what had not been implemented. Um, but the main contribution that followed your report, I think, uh, was to improve the management of large multidimensional peace operations uh, uh, through a strengthened department. Uh, um, but in our report, HIPPO, we were critical of what had become a sort of peacekeeping template um, and placed an emphasis, the phrase most quoted now, on the primacy of politics, reminding uh, people that peacekeeping operations are there to allow space for political uh, solutions and the design of intervention should be shaped by the particular political context. And it was a tribute to, to Kofi Annan's flexibility that when in 2006 we designed a mission to support Nepal's process, although he in some ways was a classical peacekeeper, he agreed that what was needed was something very different from a blue helmet operation, a, a small political mission that has been followed in uh, the similar approach to Colombia today. Um, your reports are already remarked that peacekeeping operations were being deployed where there was no peace to keep. That was true then, it's even truer today. Fifteen years later, we've had to grapple with the implications of increasingly complex and violent conflicts with increasingly uh, unhelpful regional uh, and international politics around them. Uh, and we had to debate amongst ourselves what are the proper limits to the effective use of force by Blue Helmet uh, operations. Have red lines been crossed uh, in eastern Congo or in northern Mali? Should the UN itself engage in counter-terrorism operations? We gave a rather clear answer, no. But at the same time, we certainly in strongly endorse the responsibility to protect civilians, which uh, your report had emphasized, uh, reminding people that's first of all a civilian function before it's a military function. But we also followed the Brahimi report in pointing to the problem of expectations. At the time we reported, 106,000 uniformed peacekeepers had a mandate to protect civilians across 11 million square kilometers. Uh, and of course, we emphasize the need to combat sexual exploitation and abuse. I believe there have been significant improvements in the performance to protect civilians by peace operations. But I do want to end with a final point about responsibility to protect. Um, I worked uh, uh, in Libya. Um, I was only one observer uh, of the NATO military operations in 2011 and how they related to the Security Council mandate to protect civilians. But I entirely agree that it's unanswerable that an operation to protect civilians tipped over into regime change and that has made responsibility to protect now a deeply divisive concept. Um, to this extent that I think we should ask whether it's useful to pursue those same goals, those humanitarian goals, uh, under that label. Because all the things that R2P is intended to do, prevention of conflict, peace building after conflict, now talked about as sustaining peace, protection of civilians during conflict, all can still command some support even in such an appallingly divided Security Council as we have today. But I think it was going to be very difficult to revive R2P as an effective rallying cry. Uh, but I believe that, that Kofi would continue to find ways of pursuing its objectives uh, by other names.
Thank you. Thank you. Using the full spectrum of possible ways to engage Indeed. from. Indeed. Yep. Comfort. Thank you very much. I don't have the intimacy of all of you um, in terms of, of working with Mr. Anan. Um, my moment, my chance meeting with him was when I worked with uh, Alan Doss um, in, I would say, a period of when peacekeeping was probably riding high. Um, this was in the early 2000s. Um, and Liberia has tended to be seen as one of the success stories of, of peacekeeping. And my sort of introduction and my life into the UN was partly because of, I think, what Kofi Annan's, if you're going to ask about legacy, one of his legacies, I think, to the African continent um, and to peacekeeping was the idea of partnership and using regional organizations, using sub-regions, um, recognizing that the legitimacy of the United Nations was very much contingent on working with um, regions, neighbors, um, and sub-regional entities, and giving full meaning to what um, Chapter 8 meant of the, of the Charter. And I think it was a recognition also of his part that, that realizing that the, the foot soldiers, the, the ones at the front line, tended to be the neighboring countries, um, that they were part of the problem, but also part of the solution. So that's my sort of entrance. And I think when I try to answer the question of what he meant for the continent, I think that recognition of the importance of what African nations bring towards peacekeeping was, I think, defined um, by, by Mr. Annan. And, and when you look at what um, the current SG is doing, um, Guterres, the, the sort of deference he's paying to um, the African <coughs> Union, of the strategic direction, recognizing <coughs> the future, um, the evolution of peacekeeping itself very much lays um, in you know, working closely um, with, with various entities on the African continent. I think that was very much um, started by, by Mr. Anan. Um, I also think the, the one crucial um, sort of contribution and legacy um, that he provided also for the continent, although it's still very much an awkward relationship today between the United Nations, the many faces of the United Nations and the continent, still very much an awkward relationship but realization that you can't bypass the regions um, in terms of doing peacekeeping as well. I mean, having said that, although Guterres today, when you look at how he's aligned himself, um, very much at that level, at the high, the high level, the relationship looks very conducive, um, very amenable. Him and um, Chairperson Faki at the Africa Union have a very good relationship. The relationship is a little bit more frayed, a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging at the working level. And that's because I think a no number of people think that Guterres has taken the, the, the UN a little bit too far in terms of working partnerships and relationships um, with, with the Africa Union. I mean, in terms of where next and the next chapter, and I want to sort of concentrate much of my sort of interventions into the future and it's not a perfect future, and we live in that future right now. The trends are very worrying. Um, all the doctrines that Mr. Nam sort of pursued, whether it's peacekeeping, peace building, conflict prevention, and we pay lip service to conflict prevention, um, whether it's sort of the humanitarian enterprise, um, they're all being challenged at wherever we go, whether it's in Mali, whether it's in Somalia where you served, whether it's in Libya where, where, where you served, um, whether it's in the DRC. Um, all these doctrines that, we, that we've paid a lot of homage to are, are under serious threat. Um, multilateralism, as, as everybody has, has pointed to, is also under serious threat. Whether the continent itself can define for itself multilateralism into the future, I use the United Nations as well in terms of defining a new kind of multilateralism, I think is the question that a number of us are asking, simply because the context itself, the conflict landscape itself, is a very worrying one. Um, you started to sort of highlight that um, in, in terms of Libya. Um, I would say that right now the idea, and, and both your panel um, um, papers on peacekeeping, I think began to tell that story of the, the challenge that we're going to face on the continent in terms of managing conflicts. Today, um, there, is no sort of, there is no peacekeeping mission in a, in a country where there's stability um, we've seen in the last five years um, conflict break out in places where the UN is present. And it raises question marks about the viability of the, of the United Nations and peacekeeping itself. 
um, we have seen conflicts um, emerge in countries um, where the UN has invested considerable amount of resources. Central African Republic was, a, was, was on the UN's watch. We said never again to these kind of um, emergencies. And both Central Mali and South Sudan happened in the midst of the UN. And the UN and international community were midwives to South Sudan mm. as well. So a number of question marks ab about where the UN is going to as well. I think the other issue for me, and I think what worries me what makes me very worried about in the future is that the two things that you both said were vital in your panels haven't been fixed, which is how do you give political cover to the um, SRSGs in, in country, especially today when you've got a, divi a very divided Security Council, not just divided on the big conflicts of the day of Syria, of Ukraine, and what have you, but even on the continent as well, Sudan. The UN is missing in absence in terms of finding a resolution in Sudan, and you've talked about, about Libya as well. And we're one year away from um, the future of Amazon um, and whether you know, Amazon you know, should be pulled out or whether it should stay with the, with, the UN, with the UN support. I think the most worrying, challenging thing today in terms of from an Africa perspective um, is also the, the, the endless debate about financing um, future operations on the continent as though these are African um, sort of solutions to solve of their own. So I don't, I don't give homage to this notion of African solutions for Africa problems when these are international um, threats to peace and security, issues that you dealt with and grappled with in your, in your, in your paper as well. Um, in terms of, I think, one more thing that I'd like to say, we, we tend to beat up peacekeepers um, as though they're the magic formula. And they're not. And what's missing in all these peacekeeping stories, in all these scenarios that we see, is politics. And you said it very well in, in, your, in your panels, that bringing back the primacy of politics. And when we look at all these peacekeeping missions, protection of civilians, it's, it's, it's almost an easy way out of it, you know, without dealing with the heart of the matter, whether it's in South Sudan, whether it's in Mali, and whether it's in, in the DRC. It's like dealing first with politics, because, because at the end of the day, what you need to do is to end the conflict. And you're not going to do that by asking peacekeepers to control a last way of society. So if you're asking about the future, I think it's a worrying future, because we haven't learned the lesson of mandating peacekeepers to do the most difficult jobs. They're almost set up to fail from the outset. Well, I have to say what you say resonates with me in Somalia, where I, in fact, we were talking about it the other day, uh, trying to understand the political agenda of the African Union in Somalia, and yet they had 22,000 troops with no clear political strategy, and nor, nor was there a shared understanding of the nature of politics in that country and how, you know, the international community could work together using economic, political mm. uh, you know and other tools to try and encourage mm. a way out I mean exactly. yeah. I mean both the, the UN and the AU have in, at least at the top level have invested a lot of sort of talk in terms of cooperation partnership shared values shared analysis yeah and those things tend to be missing in a number of these and I think what you're saying about Somalia is, is I, quite I want right. to ask all yeah. of you I mean it's been very interesting hearing about uh, his life since leaving the UN and all the work he did in the Kofi Annan Foundation with the elders, reaching out to young people, reaching out to business. And I wonder if he'd had that experience before becoming Secretary General, whether that might have changed some, you know, his, his, his approach to engagement mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, collective efforts to protect people and to find pathways out of, of, of conflict. Uh, Lakta, do you have a um, you know, Kofi was, was both an idealist and a realist. Uh, I mean, look just at what he did with the P5 concerning the appointment of undersecretary generals. He knew he couldn't. If you are secretary general, you've got to work with these people, and you cannot really impose your view on them. But he did something very simple. He said, you know, give me three names so that I appoint the Undersecretary General, not you. Because if, if I agree that uh, you know, the UK has post so and so, and you just send somebody and I take him in, you are appointing the man, not I. But if you give me three names, I will choose one. And you know, 
I will have appointed the. So he was, he was, he knew where he was, and he tried to make the best of uh, you know the, the, the situation. Peacekeeping and and Africa. You know, you see, the UN has to be in these places. Mm. If, if, you, if it was a matter of choice because the job is doable or not, then you know, the answer is that you know, let, yeah, let's stay away from South Sudan. Uh, you know, the job is, is, is not doable. But you don't have that option. You have to be in, in South Sudan. And you try and do what you can. And you have the interference of, uh, of member states, especially the big ones. They give you the mandate, and then they do whatever else uh, they think is expedient or in their interest, uh, even if it is at, you know, totally opposed to, uh, uh, to the mandate that they have given you. So you see, it's, uh, it's extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, the two Two, two uh, situations where Kofi found himself after he left the UN. Uh, and you see the, the difference in, in the two situations. Uh, Kenya, and Prime Minister Odinga will probably talk about that much better than I can now. But uh, in Kenya, Kofi went there, and he was given the tools, and nobody interfered with what he did. And he did a marvelous job. And then Syria. He went there as the joint special envoy of uh, the, you know, the UN and the League of, of Arab States. Uh, he was given a beautiful mandate and you know, practically do whatever you can and whatever you like and so on. But he was not allowed to do anything. And when he got people in Geneva in June 2012, uh, you know, the countries that were interested and had influence in Syria, they signed uh, up to what he was recommending. And the next day, they went to New York to turn this into a resolution, and they failed to do it because they were not, they did not believe in what they had signed in, 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 in Geneva. These are the, you know, the, the difficulty, and this is where, you know, you know if we could have a, a, a popular movement to say, please, I mean, choose your people well, uh, give them a mandate, and allow them to execute that mandate. Uh, but we'll have to navigate, you know, in this situation. South Sudan is 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 uh, is a desperate situation. Uh, you know, the country was encouraged to secede from Sudan; it has done so, and uh, you know. Uh, you know, again, there's an element of luck. Garang passed away and was killed in this helicopter crash. Uh, if he had lived, I think things would have been different uh, completely. Perhaps the South would not have seceded, and Garang might have been the president of all of Sudan. Uh, but he has gone, and the people who are there are ab absolutely. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know how to qualify them, but uh, they are not working for their people. They are working against their people. I mean, you, you talk really of the perfidy of members of the Security Council and of member states. I mean, I, is any of you suggesting that uh, we need somehow to bounce them or embarrass them into better behavior? And is, is that something you think that... Uh, uh, that, that Kofi would have uh, would have taken on. Uh, he did. He did. He, he did kind of take them on. But but I mean, in this different uh, or, or or is or, or, or is you know what's going on in the Security Council and what's going on in the world now such that no one. First thing I'd like to emphasise is that, is that Kofi Annan came up through the United Nations as an international civil servant, yeah. international civil servant and brought with him many people who also had uh, inside experience from the United Nations, although he also made some outstanding appointments of people from, from outside. Um, today, you will find very few people in the upper reaches of the United Nations who, who 
can truly be called international civil servants, the extent to which they take on that character once appointed, uh, depends. From the very beginning of the UN, obviously it was a compromise between those senior officials who P5 in particular imposed on secretaries general, um, and you referred to the way that, uh, that, that, that Kofi minimized the effect of that. Uh, but there was a genuine ideal of an international civil service, and of course Dag Hammarskjöld in particular uh, emphasized that. Uh, that's almost lost uh, today. Um, and the question I think that, uh, that needs to be asked is how that can be revived. Mm -hmm. The other question, which you, you, you asked Michael by talking about the effect of uh, civil society engagement, as it were, after the United Nations, and I had a strong civil society engagement uh, before I worked for the United Nations, is the role of civil society when we have to be rather pessimistic uh, about the state of governments uh, in the world. Uh, uh, I think it was Brian Urquhart and Erskine Childers who said, we the people open the charter and then disappear from it. Um, well, a question now is how uh, we can in this world mobilize to, to, to counter the, uh, uh, the dismal situation that we face geopolitically, uh, the strength of civil society and civil society from, from all regions of the world. I mean, the HIPPO report put a lot of emphasis on prevention as well, didn't it? And we're, and we're facing all these extraordinary phenomena now. What, what do you think, given his emphasis on prevention as well, what should we be encouraging the UN to focus on in terms of, of, of prevention beyond what is happening already? For example, in Africa, what do you think the key... Yeah. I mean, as, as I said, you know, we, we've tended to pay lip service to a number of, of these doctrines that, that Mr. Annan was sort of championing um, when he was the SG. And prevention, I think, is still the number one that neither of the, of the multilateral agencies have been good at. So it's not criticizing one. I mean, the African Union, for example, has paid a lot of lip service to it. And right now, as, as we speak, we can name about three or four countries where preventative diplomacy and prevention could help. And, and it's, n it's not just early warning, but it's early action as well, and being prepared to take that action. There have been some successes. I don't think we should ignore those successes. Um, I think what happened with, um, with, um, with Mag Madagascar was a good um, outcome for the Africa Union. I don't think we should ignore that. Potentially, they, they could act early in Burkina Faso, for example, where all the, all the indicators suggest that this is a country under deep distress, um, seeing the, the spread of, of sort of the jihadi threat from Mali um, spreading to Burkina Faso and to Niger. There's a lot of anxiety and lots of anxiousness right now in West Africa in terms of how to cope with the Sahel crisis into, into the rest of West Africa. So, so this is a moment also not just for the United Nations, but also for, for other actors to get it right, because the UN is also as good as all its other parts as well. Um, I think the, the real test case also is, is for you to do prevention effectively, you also have to agree on the analysis as well. Right. Now you, all, you have to share the information, you have to own that information and agree on the set of steps that need to be taken. So a classic example, I would say, where there was not necessarily a shared analysis was on Burundi and hence why I think he saw failure both by the African Union who owned this, but then later the United Nations who came in to, to support that, sort of their failure on, on mediation as well. Um, another sort of, another example, but a good example, and, and I want to sort of end with this good example, because what we don't know what's going to come after, um, is what we've sort of managed to, to, to get hold of in Central African Republic. Um, so last year, you know, mass, you know, mass, violations, you know, pockets of violence throughout the country. The Africa Union was asked to sort of lead, um, find a peace um, agreement after, um, after 2007, 2018, it wasted that, Russia came in. I think that the Russian element sort of, you know, fostered the, the AU to sort of step in and take control of the peace agreement. So in a sense, I think that Let's see what happens, but that is a good, good story in itself to tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sudan right now, yeah. uh, what might Kofi be doing? 
if he was still Secretary General. Praying. 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 Okay. Well, look, this you have it. This is this is a this is a moment not just for the UN, but again, I emphasise the the, the the neighbourhood as well, and but I also emphasise another neighbourhood, the Gulf states as right, well. Right. Now, you know. I don't want to make light of the international situation when Mr. Annan was SG, but it's a lot more complicated today. It's multi-layered. You know, you've got conflicts bleeding into, another, in, into one another, and you've got a set of you know, multiple actors, varying interests, no coherence, different strategies, different interests as well, and a country is right in the middle of that. Now, will, will those countries accept or be prepared to accept Sudan's brand of democratization? Will they give it space to let it to nurture? I, 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 I won't answer that question right now, but right now I think there are a number of dangerous dynamics. The fact that the Security Council has not been able to sort of come up with a coherent narrative in terms of its own position on Sudan raises a number of questions. The fact that the Africa Union, the Peace and Security Council, took a bold step on the basis of Burkina Faso to say 15 days in which to, to transition and to see that being walked back by other powerful That's interests two is now. now two months, you know, 60 <laughs> days. Now, to see that being worked back and be threatened by other interests as well, I think raises a number of questions about, about whether we're going to be able to get Sudan right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, this is going to be a worrying few months, um, worrying few weeks for, for Sudan. I didn't, Michael, take the opportunity you gave me earlier to say how depressing the situation in the Security Council is. Uh, it's an obstacle to conflict prevention uh, because the national sovereignty narrative gets stronger and stronger. Uh, and it's an obstacle to, to the most obvious need to address a situation like Libya. Let me add Libya to Sudan uh, and the fact that uh, uh, an immediately obvious need to seek to prevent an outbreak of serious fighting uh, couldn't be taken by the Security Council because certain member states um, were, were not prepared to condemn Khalifa Haftar for being responsible for the intensification of, of violence and because he had extremely strong support from Egypt and the UAE in particular, to some extent from France. Uh, the Gulf then had its effect on US policy once uh, uh, President Trump came into the, uh, into the matter personally and reversed normal US, US policy. Um, uh, that's, that's how grim things are in the inability of the, of the Security Council uh, to, to take what seem to be the most obviously necessary steps. If one brings that back to the role of the Secretary General, then, then one asks the question, you know, how much can uh, a Secretary General uh, take on uh, the uh, the, the, the current state of the, the, the attitudes of the, 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 the China, US, and, uh, and Russia in the Security Council, extraordinarily difficult to, to, to do so. Um, uh, and uh, of course, one wants to see the, the independent role of the Secretary General that is intended by Article 99 of the, of the Charter, not, not necessarily but through the formal use of Article 99, but by the central independent political role of the Secretary General that the Charter uh, envisaged. Um, and yet that is being made more and more difficult by the, by the behavior of member states. Uh, Please, yeah. Uh, I've always thought that uh, prevention is something, you know, even without all these problems that we have in Security Council and all that, it's much easier to talk about and to actually implement. Much, much easier. Uh, you know, uh, I don't remember which year. I, I think Lord Hani has already, had already gone when the Congo, after the death of Mobutu, was practically invaded by all its neighbors. Uh, of course, there was a lot of pressure on these neighbors to leave the Congo and uh, uh, at one stage, all these neighbors came to the Security Council. Well, anyhow, uh, there was a resolution in the Security Council asking Kofi to implement how the people were going to be evacuated. And Kofi then said, no, you know, I'm not going to implement this resolution because uh, <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't use this language. Uh, 
you who have adopted this resolution don't believe in it. Uh, so, you know, they had to go back to the drawing board and came back with a resolution that was implementable. Uh, but that is, that is extremely difficult for the Secretary General to do every time. Very, very difficult. Uh, you, know. you know, we are in an international situation that makes the life of uh, Secretary General and of everybody else who is interested in these things and trying to help very, very difficult. Uh, you know, when you have uh, you know, big powers, I mean, uh, forgive me, behaving in a totally irresponsible way. Uh, why, why, why is Libya being uh, uh, punished in this way? Why? Uh, it shouldn't be allowed to, to, to happen. Why isn't, you know, the Sudanese are, you know, are trying to talk to one another and try, trying to find, why, why is, is, yeah, I mean, leave them alone. If, if you can't help them, at least leave them alone. Mm -hmm. And why interfere and, so can we, can we do something? Can you all here do something about, uh, about making it easy for, I mean, for the people you mandate to deal with these, these things, the, you know, the people who are trying to follow the steps of Kofi Annan. I mean, can you do something to make it possible for them to do their job? Well, that, that's a great way to open up the, the conversation. And I've been told that because we started 10 minutes late, we can end 10 minutes late. Uh, so we'll end by 12.25, which gives us a good 45 minutes. Uh, I would be grateful if those of you who I recognize can just identify yourselves and either say what you have to say or ask your question as succinctly as possible so that we can take as many questions from the floor as possible. I see the first hand was over there and then there are two hands over here to my right. Please. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, my name's Khan Ross. I'm the Director of Independent Diplomat. Um, in which capacity I've attended the UN Security Council uh, alongside the Democratic Syrian Opposition, the Syria Coalition, the Frente Polisario, the representatives of the occupied people of the Western Sahara, amongst many others. And it's hard sitting from their seat, and theirs is the only seat, frankly, that really matters, to see the UN Security Council either as effective or indeed just. And my question is to the panel, when did it get broken? 20 years ago, I was a young diplomat at the UN, um, at the British mission to the UN. Kofi Annan was a kind of rock star to us. He did a wonderful job in, in walking the invisible line between a divided P5 on the question of Iraq, for which I was responsible, along with the issue of weapons of mass destruction, which is, 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 of course, why I'm no longer a British diplomat. And my question really is, was there a particular moment, 2003, when the Security Council, two permanent members, went to the Security Council and claimed they had legal authority to invade another sovereign, sovereign country when they did not, when they'd actually gone to the UN Security Council and asked for that, UN, for that legal authority and had been repudiated by failing to get through the so-called second resolution. The UN, in the body of Kofi Annan, took took their time to declare the war as illegal, perhaps too long, but was that the moment when the authority of the UN as a whole, which we now see in fragments all over the world, was that the moment when it was truly broken? Thank you. I'll take a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, Ronan Tynan, uh, filmmaker, uh, co-founder of Esperanza Productions and member of Chatham House. Uh, I must say I've been very affected by this presentation because of my work in Syria, and in fact, you have presented a very depressing and worrying presentation, but from my perspective, I think it's even much more serious than that, because I want to put it to you, as we speak at the moment, hospitals are being bombed with absolute impunity in, in, in Syria by the Assad and Russia. Um, now, we all know schools have been bombed with impunity. We see it's a new war, so therefore you're very familiar with what that means. It means civilians are primary targets. And in Syria, we were in the ninth year of that process. Now, Kofi Annan's career was distinguished by the fact he actually resigned and set the alarm bells off then, and of course, people ignored them. And we've seen in Syria, responsibility for protection now means nothing. 
But I want to put it to you, really. It's one thing to blame the big powers, who we know always pursue their own interests. But I want to put it to you, if we are to mobilize civil society, the UN surely cannot be seen to ally itself in unnecessarily formal ways with these tyrannical regimes. Example one, the UN humanitarian chief was pursued in a 30-minute interview to name the air forces bombing hospitals in Syria. Now, there are only two air forces bombing hospitals in Idlib at the moment. That's the first question. The second question is, when a leading humanitarian like Dr. Annie Sparrow, who saved thousands of lives in Syria through vaccination programs, in a prestigious journal like Foreign Affairs, delineates very clearly how the UN has effectively handed over control of the massive humanitarian in Syria to the Assad regime, we should all, in my view, in this room, be ashamed of ourselves. And that's really what I want to put to the panel. And if we really want change, we have to confront that reality. And my final question is this. Surely leaders in the UN do have a responsibility because ultimately leaders in the UN must have respect for the charter of which the act relates to human rights. For example, Antonio Guterres criticized for his silence on these issues by Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch. But more particularly, I'm alarmed by the recent failure of the human rights chief, a humanitarian chief in Syria. I won't go into it again. I think you know very clearly where I'm coming from. This is a huge moral and ethical dilemma for the UN. And frankly, it's not being confronted in my view. But I, I obviously would be very welcome your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we, let, we let you get away with cheating with three questions because they were so <laughs> passionate and articulate. Uh, Martin. Thank you very much. Martin Barber, formerly with the UN. Um, the previous speaker said more or less exactly what I was hoping to say, but much better than I would ever have said it. And I think the, what I would like to pick up is uh, Nakta Ibrahimi's last point on what we can all do. A group of us have come together to found a, a small group, but we hope it will be a very large group, called United Against Inhumanity, which says governments and international organizations have lamentably failed in their responsibility to protect, uh, to, this year is the 20th anniversary of the first uh, report on the protection of civilians in armed conflict. It's the 70th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions. And at the very outset of this conference, we heard about the International Criminal Court. Um, none of the speakers um, have, have mentioned, you know, why are the people bombing the hospitals in Syria not being referred to the International Criminal Court? Well, perhaps because their sponsors are blocking referral in the Security Council. We should not be standing for this. This is totally, totally unacceptable. And there must be a way that ordinary people can express themselves and say, not in our name. Mm. <laughs> should we take a few more? Or else, let, uh, let me just take a couple more, and then I'm going to turn to the panel. There's a, a hand uh, there. I'd like to invite... We've only had male men so far asking questions. So I'm going to prioritise any ladies who would like to speak. There's a lady here. Any, any others? Uh, one there, and that question there, and then we'll come back to the panel. Um, Cornelia Navari, uh, University of Buckingham. Um, uh, it does seem to me that once you've got a legal regime, and a fairly deep legal regime, that this obviates the requirement for neutrality on the part of the institution. I'm, so, so I'm really responding to, to, these, to these last questions, because it does seem to me that one of the things that does have, what you do have to turn, uh, emphasize another aspect of Kofi Annan, which was the high politics. You're all going on about the low politics. Yeah. Right now, you're in a period where you've got to <coughs> confront high politics. And one of the ways you can do that, it does seem to me, is to uh, use your legal regimes as a platform and, uh, and uh, allows you to, yes, yes, that's it. Use your legal regime. Okay. 
The lady here, and then two gentlemen. Yeah. Yes, uh, my, my name's Sandra. I was working abroad in Afghanistan, Somalia, South Sudan, um, but I came back to Britain as a European and a British person to help uh, resolve the conflict at home. My question to you is, can we continue to resolve conflicts abroad while we are so conflicted at home with the rise of populism, divisive forces, uh, isolationism? I mean, don't we need to fix ourselves uh, in Britain, in the US, in Europe, so that we can be stronger and more resilient to help, to help abroad, to help fight conflicts what, abroad. What, what do you propose in terms of conflict prevention? Keep in the home. UK? Yes. Um, <laughs> we, need to, we need a proper mission in the UK, like a UN mission where we serious. bring together <laughs> stakeholders. No, that, well, I, I'm actually, serious. I'm I think totally that's serious. a very serious point. I mean, yes. because that is to externalize responsibility for prevention. Surely it should be looking at ourselves rather than... 100%. We need to actually uh, bring stakeholders together in the UK that are very worried about the direction we are taking and actually bring together a lot of, of forces here and political uh, actors. Thank you. And that seems to me to speak to the point about prevention and the degree to which we're geared to help societies themselves yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. think about what prevention actually means rather than depend upon international actors. And what is the role of the UN mm -hmm. in facilitating that? Mm -hmm. Please. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Hans Corell, former legal counsel of the United Nations, three years at Bhutas Bhutas Ghali, and seven years at Kofi Annan. Uh, Kofi Annan was not a lawyer, but he understood better than many lawyers the need for democracy and the rule of law for international peace. And when I'm looking at the situation in Syria, I recall that in April 2012, we were sitting at my residence in Stockholm, and Kofi Annan said, you know, my task in Syria, can we work in Syria as we had worked in Kenya? Because in Kenya, Kofi Annan was asked by the African Union to come in and assist after the election in 2007. And all of a sudden, he called me in February and said, Hans, you have to come down and assist because the only solution here is a grand coalition. And of course, he had uh, Prime Minister Rai, Rai Laudinga, who is here with us, and also Uru Kenyatta, he was negotiating with them. And then we had a legal committee that drafted what eventually became the 2008 Kenya Reconciliation Act. That act would govern the country for five years, during which also they adopted a new constitution. He asked then in April 2012, can we work in Syria as we worked in Kenya? And then he was silent for a while and shook his head, no hands. I do not have the support in the Security Council, which is a precondition for succeeding in Syria. I'm going to leave the task, which I did in August. And of course, Dr. Brahimi came after him. But my concern is actually the lack of statesmanship in the Security Council. And the more I think of it, the more furious I get that these five members in particular do not take the responsibility they should for the world. And this is why I'm participating in the discussion on the reform of the Security Council. The only thing they are discussing is adding members. The Council is an executive organ, plus 11 members is the latest bid. That would be the most effective way of destroying the Council as an executive organ. So my question to you is really, how can we make, in particular, the five permanent members realize that if they don't take responsibility under the UN Charter here, they will destroy the organization. And then we have destroyed the heritage of a generation that had experienced two world wars and gave us the UN Charter. So that is my question. How can we make them understand and show statesmanship? Thank you. One more question, and then I'm going to come back to the... Thank you. Oliver Ramsbottom, sorry, um, Emeritus Professor of Conflict Resolution at the University of Bradford. Um, thank you for inviting me and organizing this remarkable assembly. Um, I really find this inspiring. Uh, from Mark at the beginning, <laughs> you mentioned a golden age of multilateralism, identified with the work of Kofi Annan, and that now we're in a different world perhaps we'll say a multipolar world of rivalry, great power rivalry. Uh, what seems to have come out of this panel, one of the big things, and uh, Lakma Brahimi at the end 
um, expressed it very well, is a broad theme which we could think about in the next two days is, is it possible, how is it possible for us to persuade leaders and leaderships of great powers that it is actually in their interest, their personal interest and their national interest, to use multilateral mechanisms rather than sideline them. However difficult that is, that could be a kind of theme and to do it in a systematic way. And that could be one way of, I'm not sure what the word is, not just rescuing, but developing and adapting Kofi Annan's legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, um, we have quite a few questions before us. I don't know who's going to take on the, the, the take them on. Uh, you know, when did the Security Council get broken? Can we make the P5 realise that they may be destroying the organisation, possibly rendering the UN totally obsolete? Uh, the UN associating itself with states that are clearly driving a cart and horses through international law. Um, how can we engage civil society far more effectively? Uh, what do we mean by prevention when states, you know, uh, are not prepared? To, who, who, wants to, who wants to have a first crack at this? Uh, okay, fight it out. Lakda, you, you... I have a crack at the question. You haven't uh, asked, asked, yeah. Uh, you know, when I, uh, I think it was 1994, I came back from Yemen and I was talking to, to Boutros about Yemen. Uh, he was not listening. You know. <laughs> and he said, will you go to Haiti? So I said, look, you know, just come back from Yemen. Don't you have something in Sweden or something like that? <laughs> and he said, if there were something in Sweden, I'm not stupid. I'll go myself. Why should I send you there? Yeah. So if there is a mission in London, I... <laughs> Uh, you know, in my old age, I, I would like to apply for the job. <laughs> it, it, it's, and it's, with, it's interesting you'd be moving from Paris for this as well. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I'm in sympathy with almost all the questions, but they really all have to end with what is to be done. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, Khan, I mean, I entirely, as you know, I'm in sympathy with your critique of the Security Council in Iraq. I'm not sure there was a decisive moment when the Security Council was broken, although that was a very serious one. Uh, I think the Security Council was flawed from the beginning. It's gone through periods, different periods, as we've said. Uh, it's now in an extremely serious, uh, serious state. Uh, uh, and greatly in need of reform. Its composition may or may not be possible to reform, but there are certainly ways in which its working methods could be reformed. And your country, Hans Sweden, I mean, made perhaps the best shot that I've seen an elected member make of it. And there is something of a mood now amongst the elected members, despite the ideological divergence among them, which is as great as the ideological divergence uh, among the P5, to, to assert themselves. And I think that's something that should go on being encouraged. But I don't think the core of the answer is going to be there. I think it has to be in, in pressures from, from outside. I, I uh, am in sympathy with, with Martin in terms of looking for civil society mobilization, but the only civil society mobilization that seems to have real spark in it at the moment is, is on climate change, uh, thanks to, to young people. I mean, how do we get that same degree of, of, of civil society mobilization around the, the other concerns that are being um, expressed here? Uh, and I certainly do think that those of us in the UK uh, must indeed face up to uh, how poorly the UK is now placed to uh, play any useful role in international affairs. Uh, I mean, having been in, in New York for, for until the last year, for three years, uh, the decline in the influence of the UK is, is palpable, uh, and we've seen it most clearly recently in the entirely, in, uh, entirely appropriate uh, condemnation of the UK over the Chagos Islands in, in the General Assembly, but I mean, a staggering degree of, 
isolation of the, of the UK. So indeed, uh, unless and until we have domestic politics that are the basis uh, uh, for an effective value-driven role internationally, then, then certainly from, from this country our, our positive influence is going to be, going to be very limited. I don't want to end with a message that says, you know, multilateralism is dead, long live multilateralism. But it's true also that I think today political capital is scarce. I think it's true also today that the parties to the conflict sense a weakness within the Security Council and are able to exploit that weakness as well. So today, glaring, you know, glaringly, you see that there's a willingness to, to go after peacekeepers, for example. Um, there's a willingness to test the UN in a way that we hadn't seen before. And the casualty figures, as you know, Michael, in Somalia, in Mali, and elsewhere is staggeringly high. So it shows you just how difficult it is today for, for, the, for the UN. Um, but, you know, the UN is one part of the, of the, of the jigsaw. Um, there are other constituent parts that are, that are vital. I mean, to go back to your, to your question on Sudan, for me, the answer doesn't lie in the United Nations. The answer lies in the region. And it lies in the Peace and Security Council of the African Union staying together and making sure that they commit to what the communique said in May. There were very clear, clear, um, clear positions that were taken by the, by the Peace and Security Council of the African Union. And we'll know you by your decisions, we'll know you by your willingness to commit to those decisions. And I think that the future Sudan does lie in how the African Union plus the neighbours are able to navigate very difficult politics between, between, the, between the region and also other interested partners, i.e. the Gulf states as well. This is our reality. So how are they doing in terms of managing I think, those? I mean, it's difficult. I mean, I mean, it's difficult also just because I think, you know, for them, some of them, they, they looked at other incidences, you know, you know they, they looked at what happened in, in Egypt. I think this is a, a crucial moment for the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia in terms of how they navigate their politics in Sudan. But it's also mm. a crucial moment for the African Union because it's also not having to deal with Sudan, but also South Sudan. And by the way, don't forget forget that Sudan was crucial in the latest peace agreement in South, in South Sudan as well. So this is why it's very important. The, the dynamics in the Horn are such that we cannot hope to wrestle this outside of the region, but it has to be wrestled within the region as well. Um, but I, but, I, I, but I, I mean, let's end on, on, on this note also that, you know, you talked about the listener in, in Kofi Annan, and um, somebody talked about the absence of statesman, statesmanship, that the importance of listening is so vital as well. And you know, the, the importance also, also measuring the room and understanding the various interests at stake as well is, is also vital as well. But the fact that one of the most important major powers, the bastion of, of, of world order, is walking away from multilateralism also makes the job very difficult today. The fact that, the, that Europe itself is divided at the moment, as exhausting all its energy on Brexit, also <coughs> makes Europe also very difficult to rely, to rely on to, to be able to navigate these complexities as well. So where else do you look at? Where else do you look at to find these solutions? And those solutions have to be, felt, be found elsewhere beyond the UN and be, <coughs> beyond Europe, but also in these regions. And one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years, by the way, is that because the UN has been weakened, because it has been absent in, in much of these crises as well, we've seen a devolution of international peace and security to the regions. Yep. And the regions themselves are, are, have to be the arbiters and navigators in terms of finding the solution to these crises. I'm going to go back to the floor. I just, the, the Oliver Ramsbottom's question was, how can we persuade leaders that it's in their interest to use multilateralism? And again, I have to say, in my experience, one, uh, one of the ways not particularly successful you can try mm -hmm. is persuade them that their own security interests are best met by people uh, having security you know what themselves. Worries, what but, it's worries, a, yeah. but what worries me, Michael, is that we're misusing that. I'll give okay. you a classic example. Today, you know, we've, there's a sudden realization that the borders of Africa are closer to Europe. Why? Because of the twin problems of migration and counterterrorism. Which, this by is the way, mis are which as, is as important yeah. as Brexit. But it's been and Brexit, European but it's been yeah. misused as well. Yeah. The idea, the idea that you can also, you know, outsource your own insecurity in this way, 
you know, and make demand on, on, on countries themselves that are going through a crisis as well is a problem. So you create a body like the G5 Sahil Force as well to do yeah. the bidding for you. So that's no, also a problem. No, that, that's yeah. a problem. But mm -hmm. I, I just, what I was going to say is uh, the two questions I have, you know, is given this extraordinary phenomenon of social media, mm -hmm. and, you know, if what I read the other day is correct, over half the world is now online, and 70% of the people are under 25 who are online, whether voices yeah. become more important. And secondly, what about the role of business? I mean, you have states patently failing to live up to their uh, own standards, but to what degree is it in the interests of the private sector and of business for multilateralism mm. to be more effective. I mean, if business is operating in an increasingly unpredictable environment, at what point will we ever get to the point where businesses start saying, hey, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense for us, let alone for uh, you know, people in affected countries. I don't think I'm going to be able to restrain my panelists. I mean, do I, OK, <laughs> and then I'm going to go back to the floor. Uh, you know, uh, our very good friend, Madeleine Albright, used to annoy a lot of people, including myself, when she repeated all the time that the United States was the indispensable country, mm -hmm. as if any other country was not indispensable to its own people. Uh, but now, I must say, we are discovering, yes, yes, that it is an indispensable country. Uh, you know, it is uh, indispensable. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the fact that the United States has disappeared, and not only has disappeared, uh, you know, from, you know, our own, uh, from being indispensable, uh, uh, you know, the f they, are, they, are, uh, they are playing, at least from time to time, a negative role. And we see that this, this, is, this is really but a big problem. Creating space Very, for other actors to fill that you know, mm. to, 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 for example, the UN, there are no, now other... No. Yeah, but you see, the thing is, uh, you know, you said to whom, whom, whom would we go? Yeah. Uh, you see, I, I fault also, uh, you know, the medium and small countries outside of Europe. You know, we used to have the non-aligned group. Mm. It, was, uh, it was a voice that was present, and they... they they, from time to time, had something to say and were heard. They are not there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, so-called uh, emerging uh, countries, you know, countries like South Africa, India, Brazil, also are not, are not heard anymore, either individually or, or collectively. Uh, and th there is, you know, uh, this, this international order, if it is important, has to be saved by somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to. It's not going to be saved uh, just like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and that is why it is so terribly important to agitate ideas, uh, to have organizations like uh, uh, Martin Barber's, uh, you know, that are you know working for, uh, you know, the people to say something. Yes, you know, uh, in Syria. Uh, you know, the, the, all the horrible things that are happening, uh, you, are, you are hardly allowed to talk about it, let alone do something about it. But it's unfair to say that the United Nations is, uh, uh, is, is handing over its responsibility about the humanitarian activities to government. No, they are not. Uh, but the situation is such that quite often that they have to uh, accept control by the government of uh, you know all the goods that they send for uh, the uh, the needy people there. Uh, otherwise, nothing will get there. And yes, indeed, sometimes the government takes out mm -hmm. the medicine and, uh, and and things like that. But what what does uh, you know the United? Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, WHO or UNICEF, what will they do? They stop, uh, you know, getting aspirin to the people because they are not allowed to get uh, uh, alcohol and uh, uh, you know, things that are maybe used to cure, to attend to people that have been wounded. Uh, 
it's, it's not an easy situation. Okay, let's take another crop. Uh, where should we start? There's a gentleman at the very back, and then I see three hands in this column. Uh, the lady, the gentleman there, and I think it's David Hannay. Uh, is it? Sorry. Jeremy Greenstock, sorry. Sorry. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, John McMillan, Brunel University. Um, some of the problems that have been identified are very similar to those from my sort of classes with Alan James on peacekeeping in the 1980s. These are structural problems that are in the mandate, and in particular with regard to the UN's effective dependence on, on states. I wonder if the UN is simply too close. Um, that it, that the, the, the single essay that impressed me most was by Mogami on nonviolence, and that the UN needs to stand for something a bit different. A lot of the things that it really does, but of a more robust attachment to the principle, the idea of nonviolence as a philosophical position, to try to move away and break free, have a counterpoint to states. So that's what I would suggest, a way of a different philosophical approach. Thank you. Thank you. The, the lady with her hand up. Ah, no, you're next then, please. Hi, my name's Mabani Wanyeki. I work now as the Africa Director with the Open Society Foundations. But at the time of the Kenya crisis, which several people have referenced, I headed the Kenya Human Rights Commission, which was one of the main, in the leadership of one of the main coalitions engaging on ensuring the mediation happened and then that it was successful. And I guess in that context, we had the great privilege of meeting many, many times with Kofi Annan, who took our analysis and used it to leverage the negotiations. And thinking about it, having interviewed him also at length several years later for my doctoral thesis, I would argue that two things are really important. I think Comfort has pointed to the fact that the region's role in African conflict is really important. But I think in Kenya, two questions of alignment were really critical, which are instructive for what's missing in terms of some of the situations today. One was alignment, not just between the UN and the rest of the international community and the AU from whom Anan had gotten his mandate, but alignment internationally, the UN, the region, and domestically. Because at the domestic level, domestic civil society, the domestic private sector, eventually we're on the same page. And I think that's something that's really missing. Um, and then talking about sort of the second level of alignment is in terms of what's missing today, you talked about Sudan, you talked about Burundi. It has been almost impossible. And if I, the, to the question, what would Anand do? I think he would be listening to the civic forces in Sudan. It has been next to impossible to get them, the leadership of the Sudanese Professionals Association, the civic forces, to meet with the Gulf states, who are playing this very destructive kind of role, to meet with the region, to meet with Abiy in his own right, to meet with Egypt in his own right. Everyone is taking the interlocutors as simply being the military actors, and the old NIS actors, and the old regime actors. Um, and I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. And then finally, a question for comfort on terms of Africa's view moving, wondering whether Africa will move towards a view of multilateralism that it will push itself. And I was just wondering if you could expound a bit on that. Thank you. I hope I'm not going to put my foot in it. I think it's Hella Pick next. Sorry, uh, Hella Pick. A former UN correspondent of The yeah. Guardian, amongst other things. Um, I really want to come back to uh, what Lakhtar said about the United States. Um, it, it's always seemed to me that the United States support, or at the very least neutrality, uh, on, towards the United Nations is absolutely essential for the UN to have to function properly. And not least, of course, because of financial issues. Nobody has touched today about the contributions to the United Nations, but American threats to cut the UN budgets has always been a problem, at least in recent times. And I think we have to think back again, how, in fact, can we persuade countries to finance the UN so that they can, in fact, undertake many of the, uh, many of the operations that we've been discussing this morning? I think this is a vital question that we should be looking at as well. Thank you very much. Uh, 
there's a gentleman behind you, um, and then I recognize... David Smith, formerly of the UN, and forgive me, working for Kofi Annan was a great privilege. Um, I seem to remember that our Secretary General always showed quiet courage, and Khan pointed out that illegal um, remark about the war in Iraq in 2004, which came at a very delicate moment um, for the Secretary General, and to me showed um, extraordinary personal courage. Um, and forgive me, sitting in the front row, but I remember Mark Malik Brown once staring down a certain John Bolton. Um, Mark, he's probably looking for you this week. Um, uh, look, uh, the question is, whatever happened to courage at the highest level um, of the United Nations? Our friend from Ireland pointed out um, a senior figure tap dancing over the question of who's carrying out the bombing in Syria, when we all know who it is. Um, forgive me um, to the panel. Um, where is the courage at the highest level of the UN? Thank you. Sir so Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Greenstock, former permanent representative at the UN. Um, now and the pleasure to be here remembering Kofi. And we mustn't be depressed by this conversation because almost everything that's been brought up as half suggestions on how we cope with what we're facing uh, is useful. What Kofi constantly did was to face leaders up with the consequences of their own decisions. And why the collapse of diplomacy over Iraq in 2003 was not the last moment for the UN was because Kofi brought the five permanent members of the Security Council together before the action in Iraq was over to talk about how the UN and they picked themselves up from the mistake that they'd made in invading Iraq. And in late March 2003, he had a private conversation. Condi Rice came as National Security Advisor to New York to set up the way in which th those members of the Security Council would lead the Security Council into picking up the pieces of diplomacy that had been shattered on the floor. And that led to 1483 and the construction of a UN framework for the handling of Iraq after the invasion was over. The UN stands for and will always stand for the fundamental principles, norms, and precepts that should underlie collective international activity. The problem that the UN has always had is that it doesn't have instruments of enforcement. They have to come from the member states. And in this discussion, as it continues, as we talk together uh, from this conference and onwards, and as we remember Kofi, we have to find ways of filling the gap of no enforcement for the principles of the United Nations. That has to lie with member states. And member states are squeezed in capitals between global thinking and local action. Just look at the whole experience of intervention. Almost all of it has never actually restored a country to something new after it enters into conflict. It freezes the situation and leaves that people to deal with the consequences of their low development or conflict, whatever it is, after those interveners have left. The UN has to be matched with civil society, with business, with all the work that you have done as special representatives, with the capacity of each people to look after itself on its own territory, because that is o the only legitimacy that actually exists for the development of peoples in harmony in each of their places and together at the global level. So everything that has been mentioned has to be pursued, has to be continued, has to be learnt again. But remember Kofi's constant activity at facing leaders up with the consequences of their own decisions when they've made mistakes. The high politics of this has to be at the centre of mending the gaps in our international system. I'd be grateful for the panel's comments on how that can be done. Thank you. Hand behind you. 
Um, thank you. My name is Jamie Pladel Bovary. I work with an NGO called Crisis Action. Um, in in theory, at least, one one possible way to overcome or, or circumvent divisions in the Security Council is via the General Assembly and uniting for peace. Uh, a few years ago, I worked on Syria, part of a global effort to call on the General Assembly to do that uh, for Syria, just after the assault of Aleppo and I think four consecutive vetoes in the Security Council. It, it didn't really work, but we did see enough momentum in the General Assembly to establish an independent investigative mechanism um, to push the accountability file forward. So I, my question is, is, is there any hope for the General Assembly uh, as, as a means to uh, uh, overcome the, these, the, the, the impossible divisions that we see today in the Security Council. Thank you. Right, I'm just going to take two more because we then have to give the panel the right to reply and I can see two hands. That's very convenient. The lady with her hand up and the gentleman here. Thanks so much. Uh, Kate Ferguson, I'm Director of Protection Approaches here in London. I wanted to build, actually go back to the point that seemed to raise some laughing but also a lot of nodding about the need to look at prevention at home. So Protection Approaches founded uh, from a background of genocide prevention working in Rwanda and we as directors couldn't conceive of the idea that there weren't really organisations working specifically to assist the UK in atrocity prevention but we could never really understand why prevention, peace building, peace education were conceived as things that should be done in some places and some countries and not others. And this was 2013, 2014, so I don't think we were prophets, but I mean very much now we can see with Trump here. We can see in this room with the kind of enthusiasm, but there's still an uncertainty of like the veracity or legitimacy of this point. And I feel like I'd just like to make two quick points. One, like we know that human rights is in a state of flux. The entire value system is under threat. That's true, but within it, there is an opportunity to really rectify or at least address some of those imbalances that have been built into the post-45 human rights system. And so the question that opened this session of when was the UN Security Council broken, there have been some problems really built into the system from the beginning. And there is something that I think all of us can do, but particularly the United Nations, in messaging this imbalance. There is a difference between the way that can the I UK... Ask your question, because we're Sure, OK, then how can we message better? Because how can we address the uh, difference between how we talk about foreign policy and international development and the way we talk about development uh, at home within our, uh, our fracturing communities? And I think that we can do that, but I think that there's a way of doing it quite seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last question here. Uh, hello, uh, Keith Rayner, a judge and the vice president of the Kosovo Specialist Chambers in The Hague. Um, the International Criminal Court is described currently as being in crisis. Uh, that's largely after a recent decision not to carry out investigation of activities in Afghanistan. My question is quite simple. Do the panelists feel there is political will to continue to support the International Criminal Court as an instrument of global governance? Right. Do you want to? Well, well, we remember that one. Well, let yeah. me try and... <laughs> I mean, no, in a word. Um, there is absolutely no possibility that the Security Council, as it is, will ever refer another situation to the ICC. Inconceivable. It's not just member states protecting particular situations. The, the, the general opposition of uh, at least two permanent members and probably three uh, ensures that that will be the case. Nor will the Security Council put any pressure on member states to cooperate as regards investigations in situations where they previously referred uh, a situation to the criminal court, be that uh, Sudan or, or, or Libya. Uh, Comfort is better qualified than I am to talk about the uh, reaction of African countries to, to the ICC. So I'm afraid the current political constituency for the ICC has become a very narrow one. Uh, and although, you know, law still has its limited force, um, uh, politically it's very hard to see how that is going to, going to turn around. Um, I, I wish that were not the reality, but it is. 
Let me respond in a more general way to one or two of the other uh, points or, or to pull them together. The, the very first question of this session talked about the UN standing for nonviolence as a counterpoint to states. It, it's no good talking about the UN being a counterpoint to states. It is states. It is states. It's a trade union of states. It has built into the charter some key commitments. Uh, uh, it has uh, a, a, a somewhat independent role for a secretary general. But that then goes to the question, whatever happened to courage at the highest level? Well, the price of courage at the highest level now is very, very high indeed. Um, and Lachter emphasized again the, the US perhaps being the indispensable nation, and well, I'm reluctant to follow him in, in, in that. Uh, but China is, if not the indispensable nation now, uh, certainly an indispensable nation. Um, in 2017, uh, a Uyghur civil society representative uh, was to attend the annual meeting of indigenous people in New York. Uh, the Chinese objected, uh, went to uh, the Chinese Under Secretary General, who's head of DESA, and you can find him on the web uh, speaking in China about how he had that Uyghur ejected by uh, the security part of the UN in the Chinese national interest. Uh, a year later, uh, the same issue went to the political level of the Secretary General, who authorized the participation, as he could only surely do, um, uh, and that has resulted in a series of actions uh, by the Chinese in order to, uh, completely unrelated to the particular issue of, of indigenous people or, or the situation in Xinjiang, uh, in order to, uh, frankly, punish the Secretary General for, for that position. That's the world that, uh, that, that, that we're in. Um, uh, and I think it can only bring us back to uh, the question of, of mobilization of, of civil society, um, because the prospect of seeking courage from within an institution which at the moment uh, is so firmly in the grip of, of governments and governments who are moving backwards in terms of their willingness to reflect the very principles of the Charter in relation to, to human rights is, is a great one. Thank you. Um, comfort. Yes, I mean, let's start with the, the, the ICC. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think, Ian Martin, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Um, also, the day that you decide to not give a visa to the prosecutor to come to the UN as well, to go and do her job as well, then, then you can also see what, what the fate of the of the ICC is. And this is the indispensability. Yeah. Of it. yeah. yeah. So, That's what they call us. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but that doesn't mean that the, the door to <clears throat> handling justice and accountability is shut because the ICC itself has, has, has found itself in this position. I think there, there are a number of avenues, a number of outlets in which to still deal with accountability. I think just the mere fact of documenting um, crimes um, as we're seeing in South Sudan itself, leaves the door to, to justice, leaves the window to justice still open. We saw it in, Li in Liberia. It wasn't the ICC. This was pre the ICC that dealt with, with, with Charles, Charles Taylor as well. And I think, so I think there are other avenues. The African Union as well, to, to its credit, although you know, the, proof will be in the, with the, with it, well, the proof will be in the pudding and the implementation, um, has adopted you know, a, an AU framework on, to deal with sort of justice and accountability. So we'll, we'll wait because the, the, the union itself is very divided on the question of justice. Um, to Methoni's question, um, in terms of defining uh, or can the continent, can the African Union sort of chart its own sort of brand of multilateralism? This is a crucial moment for the African Union. It's, it's signed up to a reform initiative, a reform initiative that requires it to be self-sufficient. Um, it's also signed up to the idea of streamlining its own um, sort of response to peace and security. It needs to play a more political role as opposed to trying to get involved in operational um, business, especially that doesn't have the financial bandwidth to, to, play that, to play those roles. I think the key, however, for the future of the African Union lies in the Peace and Security Council. It's just as div divided in a different way from the, from the UN Security, security Council. It has in the last 
sort of two years become shy and, be and gone on a retreat in, res in response to Burundi, um, can it turn the page? Can Sudan be that? Can it, can it hold firmly on Sudan? We'll, we'll see. Um, the question, somebody asked about bu business. I think it was Kofi Annan himself. He came up with, the, with a compact for business as well. Yeah. Um, so let's not forget that as well. And out of that, I think a number of businesses themselves, like corporate responsibility, social responsibilities of, of their own. But I can't end um, without talking about civil society because that's what I am as well. Yeah. And I started my business in, with civil society. And in fact, it was the United Nations Association where I built my own idealism. Um, around, um, so I've got another boss in front of me here, Sam, Sam Dawes, and I, this is where I learned about it. And this is where a number of young people um, sort of inspire themselves through bodies like the United Nations Association. It's the same civil society that championed the ICC, that championed climate change, that championed accountability, that cha championed the idea of the United Nations. And I hold firmly to the belief that it will be civil society because there are ordinary people at the end of the day who, who's, who are going to continue to drive um, these idealisms and focus people on unforgotten, unforgotten conflicts, um, unforgotten issues of the world. So, you know, I, I give a shout out to to, to, to the organisations, the the idea of civil, of civil, of, of civilization and of people, you know, being at the champion at the forefront of keeping the the UN and keeping multilateralism and giving it the legitimacy that it that it deserves. Thank you, Lacta. Final mm -hmm. word. You know, Hela Pick is absolutely right. You know, I don't, you know, Japan pays almost 20% of the budget of the United Nations. I don't see why China, India, Russia, and quite a few other countries cannot pay just a little bit more to, to, to reduce significantly the share of the United States. And that would certainly change things, um, you know, for the better. You know, but you know, we're talking about you know the legacy of coffee and uh, you know peacekeeping, peacemaking, uh, how the international community can function better, how the United Nations can do a better job. If you look seriously, and I think Jeremy knows this uh, perfectly well, if you look at you know the the documents that are already there. For example, in peacekeeping, our report, the HIPPO recommendations, and a lot of other reports, you will find that what uh, uh, <coughs> Jeremy is uh, suggesting can be done. But where is the will to do it? Where is, how, how can you mobilize the will to do it? How can you organize the, the will to do it? Uh, military intervention is, is not a good idea if it's not sanctioned and authorized by the United Nations. Um, the uh, peacekeeping is not a six-month job. Elections are not going to solve a problem because you organize one election and leave. Uh, you know, these, these are very well known. And, uh, again, Jeremy is absolutely right. The country has to pick up itself up and rebuild itself with the help of the international community, but they have to take the, the, the lead. You know, you can do it, uh, you know, you can try to do it. If you look at the, at the Bonn Agreement, you will not find one word where it says the UN will do this or that or the other. It always says the UN will help the Afghan government to do you know, everything that needs to be done, even when, in fact, you know, things were done entirely by the United Nations. But you see, uh, you know, how to manage expectations. You, know, you go to a place and you give the impression that you are going to solve all the problems in six months, and people believe you. Uh, how, how do you? not raise expectations and then manage them. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult, complicated, it takes time, and it needs collective political will. Uh, you know, it needs, you know, again, go back to, uh, again, with the permission of uh, Prime Minister Tinga to, to, to uh, Kenya. In Kenya, I think probably this is the only time when there is one track 
That's Kofi Annan's. Everybody else who was interested worked for Kofi Annan to his orders. And when Kofi Annan told uh, Condoleezza Rice not to come to, to, to Nairobi, she didn't come. When he told the French foreign minister not to come at all, he didn't come at all. Uh, and everybody else, you see, the UN, the, A, the AU, uh, 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 you know, the, the people in, 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 in the elders, the African presidents, everybody worked for, 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 for coffee. And, and it worked. Uh, in Syria, everybody worked against coffee. Not for coffee, but against him. Uh, so, you see, how, you know, uh, how are we going to change that situation where, where, and, and have, you know, when, when there is a crisis, have a situation like well, the coffee had in Kenya, not like what he had in Syria? Very big question, and something, yes, uh, you know, that, that, that needs to be, uh, continue to discuss it and, 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 and find ways of, uh, of getting closer to it than we are now. Well, thank you. Could, could I just support one point from a questioner that we haven't referred to? The General Assembly. The General Assembly point, yes, exactly. Um, You're, we're deep into penalty time, but go ahead. <laughs> well, just that I really do think that if we're talking about civil society mobilisation, we should also be talking about more about building alliances in the General Assembly uh, and not to give up completely on the Security Council, but to recognise how, how great are the hurdles in, in working with the Security Council and, and seek to do that and, and pay tribute to UNA UK and the elders for the rather successful campaign to open up the Secretary General selection process, which was a mobilization of civil society with the General Assembly to push back uh, the exclusive power of the Security Council. Well, thank you for uh, really a terrific session. Uh, and, you know, yes. That may render my closing words redundant, but I can't resist saying that a strong theme has been, you know, how can the legitimacy of the UN, given that it is a club of member states, be used more effectively and imaginatively to prevent, resolve conflicts, build peace and protect civilians? And I think we've heard some answers and they are partly embodied in what uh, Kofi Annan did, which is be more creative and imaginative and deliberate uh, than, uh, you know, as possible, uh, uh, including uh, by appealing to the self-interest of member states and the responsibility of leaders for the consequences of their decisions or their failure to take decisions. I'm also very struck by the emphasis in this meeting on partnerships and how the UN really has to see itself not just as the UN but as providing uh, the basis for mobilization of much broader groups of actors both within countries that are affected and internationally and finally I think what's coming through is the need for a stronger narrative about what's going on uh, in the world and I think uh, Kofi was the most wonderful communicator he could explain very simply, very complicated things in ways that made people realize where they fitted and what they could do and what the desirable end game could be. And it is that which is so desperately needed at the moment. So thank you all very much. Thank you, panelists, and thank you for some great questions from the floor.